Jung collecting and the receiving of images. I was pleased to discover that the foundation included an essay on Jung's collecting in the book that has inspired today because there is an art to collecting and it is available to each of us, even those who relinquish all hope at the words, let's draw. Collecting offers an easy and natural link to any discussion of the reception of images because the images we save and privilege receive with a maximum amount of consciousness are those we have collected. Whether the image is from Christie's and hangs above the mantle or is cut from a magazine and taped to the fridge, it is a collected one. Moreover, we know that since the material and the imaginal have equal standing as source material, the pebble we take from the riverbed or the shell we snag from the beach are just as much images as those found in our dreams. Prompted by the essay, C.G. Jung, The Collector, to revisit the early chapters of Memories, Dreams, Reflections, it's great how much it's come up uh, today, I was reminded of Jung's own engagement with the natural world at a very early age and consider it, as with many of us, one of the first engagements with collecting. This awareness, this haptic desire to touch, assemble, and perhaps take home can be even more poetically charged in the city. Truth, I think the uh, shadow flag is a great example. The feather on the sidewalk, the acorn on the subway platform, the butterfly wing on the park bench. They cause us to wonder. They open a hatch to the imaginal. How on earth did it get there? Maybe one day we may contemplate why it was we were meant to cross paths with this thing, how the reception of this specific image and this one alone offered a refrain to our day. In his essay, Thomas Fisher gives first order importance to the fact that Jung was a collector of wisdom, especially wisdom which was marginalized, deemed esoteric by the gatekeepers of knowledge who in the process of their gatekeeping overlooked ideas about the psyche and its collective manifestations. Much of Jung's physical collection was assembled to advance this cause and I encourage everyone to return for a moment to symbols of transformation to recall the rich store of images that Jung employed to make his points. Everything from a Rubens to a Native American headdress and many things in between gathered from Bali, Assyria, India, the list goes on. Photos of his study prove that Jung surrounded himself with images and objects of importance to him and the essay gives a good accounting of the art and I note that word's limitations when it comes to describing something like a great fang ceremonial staff that hangs from a doorknob in one of those pictures. Uh, so this is a collection of what Jung both assembled and was given over the course of his lifetime. Honest collecting equals living with images, living with art. A line in the essay drew my attention and turned out to be footnoted to the protocols for MDR. In it, Jung describes multiple excursions he made to the Louvre on a three-month student trip that included Paris, one he took in his late 20s before marrying Emma. There were multiple visits to the Mona Lisa, for instance. In this discussion, Jung is quoted as saying, quote, I absorb the works of art into myself, unquote. This is the essence of engagement behind any genuine collection. It is what compels the collector. The act is bigger than seeing and contemplation and more organic than mentalizing. It is about absorption. The metaphor brings us to ingestion and digestion, taking something deep into the body where it can be made use of for life. The proximity, the frequency of, count of encounter that a personal collection allows is what gives it potency, makes it medicine and inspiration. We also know this about analysis, which provides a space where internal images are constantly being held and given priority. Obviously, ownership for some is a rush. It bestows other benefits and poses other problems. But I would say the most honest collectors purchase, take, or accumulate because the having is key to the best absorption. And once absorbed, where are they? These images remain in the unconscious where they mix with other images to form associations, color in archetypal contours to make instinctual propensities, 
and visions a living reality, and in doing so, vivify complexes, the organizing centers of our psychic lives. The image that is absorbed is the image plus the experience of the encounter. This is important because it is only with experience felt in the body, I think Patricia also agrees with this, that we grow as human beings and that the personality takes on dimension. The Mona Lisa as an image includes the felt memory of visiting her. A second critical trait or capacity of the collector, one that supports this metabolizing desire, is a strong visual memory. Again, this is something the best collectors and psychoanalysts have in common. Jung certainly had this. In MDR, he alludes to this gift and contrasts it with his lack of interest or skill when it came to mathematics. Images are more useful the closer to consciousness they reside and the more nimbly, brain chemistry notwithstanding, they can be retrieved. There's a quality of attention often alluded to as hovering, described by analysts of many persuasions, that facilitates this recall. But when art is on the wall or the tabletop, one is constantly reminded of specific images, consciously or unconsciously. Recall is supplemented by prompt. And when the art stands for more than itself, nutrients that we know it has but cannot directly parse, it bridges us to the symbolic and the realm of the unconscious. Any windowsill or shelf can become an altar if something symbolic is placed upon it. When this object is joined by others, there is an assemblage, next reverberation, and perhaps a cause for a certain reverence. This is why the images with which you surround yourself are important and the craze for image boards is not foolish. There is more than meets the eye happening in any intentional still life. I love this term because Max Burkhardt has taught us the autonomous being in things is strengthened in silence. Things are less exploitable. Collecting is about guarding the stillness, the essence or quiddity at the center of an image so that connections with the objective psyche can be strengthened even if not everyone recognizes the psychological dynamics in play. One last anecdote from MDR. Uh, Jung describes an exit from a natural history museum in Basel when he was a young boy. It was the end of the day, he was with his aunt, and because of the hour, they were compelled to exit by a route different from the one on which they came. Some of you might know this story. They, this toured them, this exit, toured them through some antiquities galleries in the Fine Arts Museum, where even with fig leaves, things were evidently a little racy. Jung's aunt was busy worrying about the scene and her very receptive nephew. Jung simply recalls an MDR, quote, I had never seen anything so beautiful, unquote. I mention this because it's fun. It humanizes a little Jung but mostly to highlight the serendipity that is key to our reception, our absorption and later recall. When we are redirected, when we go down untraveled halls, we are most often receptive to new images. It's an obvious point, but one worth reiterating in a life full of routine. This is obviously like why people love travel. It's not just the beach, it's the freshly collected image. A serious collector knows this, so does a good analyst. It is imperative to seek out new experience, travel new paths, even to the same familiar things. The museum is a place that can provide this experience. It's why one of the singular thrills a museum offers, which is little remarked upon, in addition to looking, is getting lost. It was with that general premise in mind that I embarked on a project a little over two years ago. I did not aim to get lost but I did purposely turn myself over to chance. Every day for a hundred days, I randomly selected a room at the Met and stayed for exactly 60 minutes, absorbing what there was to be seen. I had a session with a room. 60 minutes. <laughs> Uh, prior to beginning, I'd surveyed all the numbered spaces on the museum's floor plan to determine what qualified and felt like a room, and sometimes it did come down to feeling. Suffice it to say, there needed to be four walls, a ceiling, a sense of enclosure, and at least one single object from the museum's collection. 
It needed to be a container, like a consulting room. Then each day I randomly selected a room by drawing a number that I had written on a disc and placed in a bag. I observed many things, bedraggled tourists, sleepy guards, magnificent art, the Jehovah's Witnesses, first dates and an, uh, and an engagement. Saw that, amazing. I overheard the banal and the beautiful. I was a fly on the wall. But one thing that I experienced more personally than I had even contemplated were a handful of collectors in the background. There were the Annenbergs and their Impressionism, the Gelmans and their ferociously fearless modernism, Begruen and his clays, and the Reitzmans, who fate emphatically insisted I should get to know, <laughs> especially Jane and her affinity for 18th century French furniture. My luck. Uh, today, though, I'd like to read just two days of encounters. The first is from the Egyptian galleries, where the Met itself was often a patron, sponsoring digs in the early part of the 20th century. Uh, the second is a room that Met fans might distinctly recall, one in the layman wing. Um, as an aside, while I do mention a Jungian concept or two, my book, The Outgrowth of This Project, is pitched for the general reader, so they are meant to be accurate, but also user-friendly. It's my hope that concepts which have been so helpful for us in our analysis can make it further into the world. So this was day 69, and it was room 124. Intimate collections favor smaller things. Kinship thrives on diminution. Easier to handle can often mean easier to love. Our earliest ancestors were smitten, stone, shells, feathers. Later came figurines, bottle caps, and jewels. From natural specimen to glitzy trinkets, these objects were perfect for the palm or pocket, later a handkerchief, shoebox, or shelf. Small collections by count or scale can do everything that large collections can, because simply put, the first rhetorical injunction of any collection is compare and contrast. As an aside, we might say that any analysis of art or psyche also starts this way. Color, shape, material are always present. In a glass-walled room a little bigger than an alcove, the museum had assembled objects from the 19th and 20th, century, uh, 20th dynasties of Egypt. On shelves, these objects became a collection. Most stood under 12 inches high and had come from tombs and temple complexes. Their preciousness, an adjunct of size, compounded alongside other small things and invoked a greatness, smaller than small, bigger than big. Like a seed, many of these artifacts referenced a larger manifestation, and this idea could be intimated, assuming fertile imaginative ground, in one long extended look. Other than rudimentary descriptions, little information was provided about these objects, so the objects were referential, but also remained themselves, things on a shelf, less tethered to a curatorial argument than usual. As enigmatic holdouts, they cast a spell. Shawapti, small Egyptian statues found in tombs, a provisional workforce for the deceased in the afterlife, garnered a bit of explanation, but scarabs, rings, and glass vials were on their own. What the viewer had to go on was their eye. Again, colors did more than their share to describe this ancient Egypt. The deep indigo of the faience, the Nile green of the scarab, the terracotta of the other household items, the sandy limestone carvings and ostraca pottery shards that were essentially loose sheets of paper, perfect for scribbles, they all colored a kingdom. And then there were the shapes, the human and the animal, the broken and the exquisitely whole. A visitor encountered a culture at the intersection of what, of what it had crafted to live, what it had chosen to model, and what was fated to survive. I could imagine a similar trove in an old Egyptologist study across from the college. Pictures of Freud's consulting room showed these sorts of bits cheek to cheek with other artifacts of erudition. Jung must have had a scarab somewhere. He admired the symbol of transformation and studied it intently. But most visitors would have to start from scratch since the facts surrounding these finds were so undisclosed. The viewer would have to rely on models of address other than thinking. Jung outlined these in his work on typology. In addition to thinking, were feeling, sensate, and intuition functions. 
Through these functions, individuals consciously engaged their world, but no one relied on each function equally. People had natural tendencies, developed strengths, used what served them, and called it a day. The combination of their typological preference along with their introversion or extroversion created personalities broadly defined as types. Feeling, as elaborated by Jung in typology, was not about emotion, but rather value. Feeling types were good at making assessments, what they valued and what they did not. Part of any aesthetic judgment would always involve determining what one really enjoyed. Collections required favorites, or they were dead. An owner had to know what she would save in a fire. It was also helpful to know how one assessed the components of representation, what bridged someone most empathically to the object. Was it color, line, materiality, or a certain style that was a combination of a few? Naming these aspects required the sensate function, the deft observation that only senses could provide. Finally, a visitor could reckon with objects through their imagination, intuiting something of the worlds that surrounded them and that they in turn helped to create. The craftsman who made the object, the noblewoman who carried it in her pocket, the desert nomad who discovered it, the collector who bought it, the curator that persuaded that collector to give it to the Met, and the preparator in the white gloves that put it on the shelf. Intuition as a way of knowing registered a past and a future and acknowledged that much of our knowing was left to our imagination. While I was standing inside the glass enclosure of Egyptian life, an Asian woman entered and stopped in front of a section with the smallest items, a beaded necklace and some scarabs. It was just the two of us, more intimate than either of us acknowledged. I continued taking notes, but was moved by her privacy. She took out her coin purse and began to study her change. Foreign change demanded precisely the scrutiny this room was calling for. The necklace and gold must have made her wonder what she had of her own. Her change was her collection, her assemblage of value that could only be understood with investigation. There was no manual. She was immersed. The aura of the space had led her back to coins, to quarters the size of hieroglyphs with symbols all their own. She had an archeologist stare. The only thing that was missing was sand. I became more intrigued and turned slightly to face her direction with my notebook as an honest alibi, but I had gone too far. It was her treasure after all. Within seconds, she had scooped the coins back into her purse and was gone. On a statue at the entrance to the room, a bit of an inscription on a shwapti was translated from the Book of the Dead. It invoked Osiris, the chief color maker of the treasury. He felt very much present in this room, presiding over these objects affected by time and circumstance, but still carrying an inner motive. The atmosphere was getting quieter. Out of the corner of my eye, I saw Ra, the sun god, the orb atop his head, ready in his bark. I was rarely at the museum so late on a weekday, so close to closing. I could feel the setting hour and the slight reanimation of the guards. They hinted at the conclusion of things. This day was almost done. Wind was picking up in the reeds. A woman came into the still small room. She was slightly transfixed because she continued to sing to herself. So fast forwarding three millennia, we get to uh, day 88 and room 951. Eight-sided novelty. The Met's only octagonal room was paved in a maroon marble that with its scattered veins of white made it look like a case of sherry had just spilled over Carrara. Six sides of the room housed flush full height cabinets, the remaining two were entrances. A central table presented a three weld ceramic wine chiller from France. Overly demonstrative lion heads topped each handle. The room was a cabinet of wonders, styled to impress shaped to entertain. In the ceiling, a stained glass skylight resembled a bower cupola. Green ivy and purple grapes descended against a leaded trellis which held otherwise white panes in place. The skylight had once illuminated the central hallway of Robert Lehman's townhome on 54th Street. The room was peculiar. Cabinet of Wonders, the curator's term, failed to fully express its eccentricity. 
great sums of money and affection had expedited a horribly particular collection. Strange treasure would have been closer to the truth, but even then, too generic. While there were no skulls, no coral, no shrunken anything, what the Lehmans chose to collect in this regard was a far cry from the early Italian and Netherlandish painting that literally hung next door. Certain, obje certain objects confessed a refinement, cups and saucers in particular, but altogether the assemblage was outlandish. Taste that began with a romp accelerated into a gallop the longer one looked. The few th a few things were over the top. Despite the opprobrium of most of the snuff boxes, which managed to contain a good deal of lavish decoration and limited space, a turquoise colored glass box encrusted with diamonds and rubies dispensed with all subtlety. Commissioned by Frederick II of Prussia, it honestly looked like someone had gone crazy with a bedazzler in craft class. <laughs> My brain could get no further than a theory of relativity. More was better, richer the best. When decoration trumped representation as the primary artistic task, taste had fewer constraints. My own snobbishness was ready. Toothsome words like hideous came to mind. In truth, hideous things scare us, inspire terror from the old French hideous. Appalling taste reminds us of our subjectivity, our lack of consensus, and how alone we often are with what we think is pretty. And I was feeling quite alone. One cabinet was dedicated to medallions, pendants, and a hair ornament that hung against silk fabric like an earring in a department store. Religiosity and erudition had erupted into strange jewelry accretions. Miniature carvings were no larger than a nickel. It was impossible to recognize much about them, even from a close distance. The subject matter existed principally for its owner, the one in the know. All the audience needed to grasp was the obvious time and skill as well as the money and power required to produce and require such an object. Most of the figures portrayed things, uh, most of the figures portrayed within these dangling jewel encrusted feats were less than an inch high. I could make out Hercules, Cupid, Venus, Justice here and there. One ornament freakishly featured the flaying of Marcius. His flesh was gold. Large, ponderously shaped pearls were transformed into a dolphin in one instance and a lion in another. Enhanced with enamel and other assorted jewels, they could become almost anything. In another cabinet, a German cup was supported by an enchained Turk. He was ivory, the cup was jade, portrait busts popped from the lid like mushrooms. Jewels were embedded and gold filigree placed between them. I could hear the president of the auction house whispering to the Lehmans, priceless. While trying to process it all, wondering where the fantasy ended and the excess began, a guide from Museum Hacks, it's because it's a kind of an internet-led group, leading a zippy tour at a places to go, people to see pace, looked at the group he had just ushered in and simply said, steal or burn. <laughs> in adjacent cases were more cups of jasper, agate, and lapis lazuli, Necklaces and girdles wrought crystal vessels carved into dogs, marine monsters, and dragon heads. On the opposite side of the glass, on the opposite side of the room, glass objects filled the shelves. Roman glass on the top, colorful, colorful opalescent, but looking slightly seasick at times, kooky and kind of cattywampus, given the technical proficiency and or standards of the age. Below were vignettes of lamp-worked glass from the second half of the 18th century. Small figurines were set atop a sheet of glass no larger than a piece of paper, the edges of which were disguised with something like modeling clay to resemble a ground. It was all very reminiscent of an elementary school art project or the skating tableau that appeared in my parents' living room each, room, each, uh, each year at Christmas. In one example, Moses floated down the Nile on the brink of discovery. In another, Susanna was already found out. Two elders looked in her direction while she held her arms out as if shaking an invisible picnic blanket. In this glass version, it was unclear whether she was upset at the spying or actually grateful for the surprise. 
A good shepherd resembled Pierrot, and St. Francis was so textured he looked like he was almost made from macaroni. The only way to square how the same collecting personality could amass these childlike objects alongside all the serious crucifixions just next door, aside from a his and hers distinction, which of course I had no proof of, was compensation yet again. Something had to balance out all that effete seriousness. Nevertheless, naivete did not escape its own grand pretensions. The more I looked, the more scenes only grew in scale. St. Anthony was surrounded by black, gray, and green devils defecating as they hounded him. Impressively, he seemed to think things were under control. And in the largest scene, a dollhouse-sized life of Christ unfolded from a nativity in the lower room to a resurrection on the top level where Jesus hovered like an angel on the edge of his sarcophagus. The structure and surrounding objects made of cardboard, paper mache, glass, mirror plate, glass seed beads, shells, paper, wire, wood, cork and paint created a grotto sensibility that had aged and sagged over time to the point of dinginess, otherwise known as a conservation nightmare. Regardless, something in all of this had caught the Lehman's eye. There had been a spark. Other representations of the life of Christ were out there. This they well knew. Maybe it was the glass or maybe it was the perversity of it all that attracted their attention. Nothing else I had seen in the museum resembled it. Maybe an Italian dealer threw them in just to get them out of his back room. Or maybe with their tiny Fisher Price scale and natural materials, these tableaus were more relatable than the panel paintings the Lehmans had amassed. Perhaps they ignited his imagination more or in a beloved alternative way. Maybe it took a slightly hideous wonder to really make them wonder. Christ did admonish his followers to become like little children. Surprisingly poignant was a scene in that dollhouse life of Christ representing the disciples in the Garden of Gethsemane. These tiny figures were tipped over, asleep, as if they had just been downed in a little boy's game of toy soldiers. What I hope my experience of these two rooms seated in your own imagination was that rooms are places where meaning is made because collections can be intimately received there. Also, I hope you saw in your mind that rooms can have a personality as much as a single artifact. The room shows the collectors, the museums, and even for a moment, our own personality as it confronts us with our likes and dislikes what we know and the limits of our knowledge. Rooms themselves are an image to be received. The therapeutic question that we ever contemplate, but probably deserves more seriousness and I dare say specific description is, what is it like to be in the room with this person, this particular collection of life? Collections are images of accretion and distillations of libido, passion. With all the making, buying, saving, finding, displaying, these things have received a lot of touch. In his essay, Thomas Fisher notes that aspect of the collector and is certainly a quality that many of us associate with Jung. His passion shows in the breadth of his collection from geological and zoological objects, early Northern European prints, copies of old master paintings, including halls, which sort of surprised me, to Asian art, African art, and of course, alchemical texts, which allowed him to collect books, objects, and images all in one. If the collection is a proxy for the personality, which I believe it is, one thing that stands out with Jung's is its serious range. If the personality stands to expand in the face of a collection, it does so because of presence, novelty, and the object's ability to hold the symbolic. We help ourselves in this regard when we collect an archetypal gesture, I believe. Museums can help us along, expose us to images, but also inspire us to collect. In preparing for a meeting tomorrow, I stumbled over one of those great lines from Jung tucked away in an essay that is far from the, from the limelight. In his essay on Weltanschauung, he says, quote, 
Only when mirrored in our picture of the world can we see ourselves in the round. I'll read it again. Only when mirrored in our picture of the world can we see ourselves in the round. It's a very roomy sentence, space making. Collections filled with so much love and intent do just this. They offer back our picture of the world and with it an invitation to see ourselves in a more well-rounded way. Collecting too has sides and shadow, and I would be remiss if I did, it, did not at least acknowledge the fact. Before his break with Freud, Jung links it in an essay to a manic displacement, and it would be right to wonder when does collecting become hoarding? Just not here. For now, we will let that shadow rest and think of collected thoughts, collected breath, how we collect ourselves, and how once collected, we are hopefully more open to, re to receive something new, an image to mirror and move our world. And I actually have one more thing, and it's a homework assignment. <laughs> or you can think of it as extra credit if you're wired that way. Um, so go home to your house or apartment, um, collect yourself, a look around and select three, four, five objects. That's, those are all good uh, Jungian numbers and make a still life. I'll leave it up for a week, look at it from time to time. And at the end of the week, uh, take one last look and see what it has to tell you about yourself. Thank you.